All right. So, we in the last section understood how you research with users, how you explore their contexts and how you understand by getting into their shoes or speaking with them, uh, observing them, what their needs are and what their priorities are, right? Now we are going to speak about conducting the research through some more direct techniques like interviewing. We will spend some time in interviewing and we will learn about question framing. How do you frame questions? So, you need to remember that you are going to get what you ask. Depending on what you ask, the answers will come to you. So, it is good practice for you to do the due diligence, to frame your questions very, very carefully, to give due thought and uh, frame your questions on the basis of what do I want to know? what is it that I am wondering about, what am I curious about, right? So, those are the things you need to frame questions on. So, user interviews, you have probably done interviews of different kinds, job interviews etcetera, what are user interviews like? So, ideally you go in a two person team, right? You would have one person who is the moderator, who is the person who has all the questions and who is interacting with the user um, and there is the note taker, the second person who is just listening, who is taking down everything that the user says. Okay? And this is the interviewee, the person who is being interviewed. Now, you can see also that they are sitting in a comfortable environment which is probably this person's home. It is a good idea to interview in settings like this which puts the person at ease, which makes them feel comfortable and makes them much more open to sharing with you, more comfortable with sharing with you. Okay? Now, the moderator ideally must not be the note taker. Why? Because the moderator is interacting with the interviewee, they are making eye contact, they are a doing active listening. What is active listening? Active listening is where you are completely focused on the person who is speaking to you and you are listening to everything they are saying, you are taking it in. And the other thing that the moderator needs to do is as they are thinking, as they are absorbing, they are probably forming other thoughts in their head and they have to think on their feet. So, they need to be thinking um, you know if there is something important that comes to mind and uh, then ask. Of course, go you can see that she has come with all her pre prepared questions, but then as needed to jump in and ask some extra questions that seem like uh, very important to ask that you may have forgotten to note. So, um, it is very important that the moderator not be distracted with anything else, but be able to give complete attention to the person who they are interviewing and the note taker is taking down everything that is going on. Okay. So, interviews what do they do? They further clarify and add depth to our observations. So, you have been in the field, you have gone and observed, you have probably done some secondary research, you have done some uh, literature research um, and at the end of it now you want to hear it from the horse's mouth, right? You need to actually find out from the actual user what the issues are. So, let us understand what framing questions is all about. First thing you need to set proper expectations, tell the user why you are there, tell them what you are looking to do, uh, tell them how much time it will take, um, tell them briefly about the project, tell them that you are going to take notes. If you can, um, you, uh, I mean ideally you should videotape, if not at least audio tape. So, tell the user you are going to do that, tell them that there, that information is not going to be used anywhere else except within the team and it is for the purpose of record 
record keeping only. Because many times people get very uncomfortable when you are taking their interview and they want to know where this is going, everything that they are telling you, where is this going? Is it going to appear in the newspaper tomorrow morning? So, it is understandable that people are uncomfortable. So, set all those expectations and tell them exactly what you are going to do and how long it will take. That is also the right polite thing to do. The next thing you need to do is shut up and listen. This is extremely important. You have gone to the user to listen to their perspectives, to uh, gain as much as you can and to draw out all the, um, the innermost thoughts, problems, issues uh, and ideas that they might have. So, go with an attitude of active listening and just throw to them an open ended question or maybe a specific question, but give a question and then keep quiet and listen to everything they t are telling you. Sometimes maybe prompt them and what else, why? Right? We will talk about some of those things some more, but listening as much as you can is extremely key. Minimize biased questions, do not ask leading questions and I will show you some examples of what leading questions are, um, because you will have defeated the purpose of the question. If you have uh, kind of put an answer into the user's mouth, then that is what they will feed back to you and you will have learned nothing. Be friendly, very, very important. Be friendly, be warm, be empathetic. Avoid generalizations. Oh, so the reason you cannot do this is because you, um, you know, you have not uh, been through the entire education process or whatever it is. Something that is maybe demeaning or uh, generalizing about everybody. So, all, all women uh, think like this or, um, you know, um, all elderly people are like that. So, avoid uh, making comments or statements like that, generalizations, just listen, right. And do not forget the non-verbal cues. What are the non-verbal cues? The frowns and the smiles and the thinking, you know, if they are thinking for a long time, you could ask them, you know, what are you thinking about. Um, so, um, you know, all of those kind of non-verbal cues that you know um, that, that if you are alert, if you are sensitive to observing them, you will get those non-verbal cues, right. Be very alert to them, so that you can ask them. I notice that you are uh, thinking a bit or I notice that you frowned when you looked at this, what was going on through your mind, okay, things like that. So, here are some examples. How did you like the login screen? What is wrong with it? What is wrong is you have you assume that they like the login screen. Better would be to say what did you think about the login screen? Okay. Is the feature helpful to you? Much better way to ask is is the feature helpful or not helpful to you? Why? Okay. Would this be a good idea? Instead, ask how valuable would this be to you in your job? Okay. Um, so, these are very important points in how you frame the question about you know not having biased questions, not leading the user and uh, you know not, not putting words in their mouth. Interviewing is both an art and a science. You need to carefully write down, you need to very diligently go through the step by step process, but you also need to think on your feet. You also need to be uh, cognizant of the other nuances of the user and uh, uh, aware of uh, you know a lot of the non verbal things that you can pick up if you are in tune with them. All right. Okay. In interviews, one of the most important questions you could ever ask is the question why, why. Let us look at an example. Why did you select those wedding invitations, right? This was a, a, an exercise in which they were trying to select from among a bunch of wedding invitations. 
Um, so why did you select those wedding invitations? What did the user say? I really like the traditional design and the heavy cardstock. You could have stopped right there and then you would have gone away saying, okay, this is the kind of design they chose and they prefer the traditional design and the hard, uh, heavy cardstock. You ask then, why is the heavy cardstock important to you? Okay. Only if you ask the question why will you get an answer. If you do not ask, it ends right there. Remember that. So probe as much as you can. What does the user say then? The heavy cardstock makes the event seem more formal and substantial. It makes the event seem more formal and substantial. The quality of paper uh, is, is uh, reflecting on the quality of the event that she has in mind. Okay. Why is it important that the wedding be more formal and substantial? Remember, you are asking why again. If you had stopped right here, you would have said that she just wants, to, uh, wants the event to feel more formal and substantial. Why is it that the, uh, uh, important? Right? And then what does the user say? My friends had fabulous weddings and I really want to do something on par with them. There comes out the deeper human uh, sort of motivation criteria and uh, the fact that she wants to be as good as her friends or not uh, be uh, in any way inferior to her friends weddings. Okay? So it is important to un understand these kind of deeper, um, uh, deeper issues that are in the user's mind and you will never find out unless you ask the question why. Now Donald Norman says, try asking why five times, five times to find the real problem. Um, if you do that, then you will have gone deep enough to know what the real problem is. Okay? What are some other ways to ask? You know, if you are, um, sometimes you are at a loss of words, how to frame your question, right? What are your thoughts on this? Okay, that is a good way to ask rather than saying, oh, do you like this? Right? What are your thoughts on this? Any other piece of information you think may be useful? This is an extremely important question to ask because when you think you are done and you, uh, the user also thinks they are done, you ask them anything else that you can think of, anything else that you would like to add and sometimes the best and the uh, most useful nuggets come out then. When they say, oh yeah, and you know when I was going to the grocery store and I was doing such and such, this is what happened. And then bingo, there is some very important nugget of information that comes out. Would it be helpful if there were a way to whatever it is the project that you are working on, for example, annotate your files. right? So then they say, yeah, that would be extremely helpful, right? Then you need to ask, if you stopped right there, you would say, oh, they thought it would be very helpful to uh, have a way to annotate the files. And then, you know, you have lost a beautiful opportunity to get their expectations of it. What would you expect of it? If there were a way to annotate your files, what would you expect of it? Okay? Would this information be useful to you? Right? So that is another important uh, way to ask. Now, when you go out, when you go out for the interview, what all should you take with you? You must go very well prepared. Sit down and prepare your questions and your questions should be the answer to what do I want to know? What am I confused about? What am I, what do I not know? What am I wondering about? all of those things, based on that, based on those questions in your head, write down the questions you want to ask the user. Right? You need to go with a notebook, a camera, video re recorder, audio recorder, colored pens, all of those things. What else? Very important, go with a smile, be warm and friendly, go with your whole bag of empathy, try and get into their shoes, try and understand the pains that they are going through and then the ability to listen and watch. 
listen and watch not to be passing judgments one of the most important things that you should not do in an interview is ever to pass judgment so let's look at this from the d school that talks about if you were to look at your interview visually what would it look like right this is how over time it would look like over time and the amount of time you spend on it right so first you introduce yourself then you introduce the project then you build a little bit of rapport with them you know ice breaking some warm up questions oh how long have you lived over here uh, how long have you been in this job and um, do you enjoy uh, you know the the area of work that you're in uh, things like that just general um, things to warm up the person to make them comfortable because you are a random person who's gone into their um, office or their home and asking them all kinds of questions so give them an opportunity a little bit of time to get comfortable with you then evoke stories can you share with me a time when something worked really well or can you share with me a time when um, um you know something uh, can you share with me one of your really good days can you share with me a really bad day can you tell me um you know the first time you interacted with this or the first um inter uh, uh, you know first uh, opportunity you had when you thought uh, when you heard about this so evoke stories right ask them to tell you stories then explore their emotions right what what did it feel like how did you um, react when such and such happened when um, you know when when things went wrong on the bad day what did you do what did it make you feel how did you uh, kind of manage the situation right so these are more exploring emotions and then uh, question statements some of the things they've said some more questions um, you know to to um, probe and kind of finish up some of the things and then thank them and wrap up thank you is very very important right thank them and i would also ask uh, also tell you that uh, may i call you again in case i have another question in case i have something else that i remember may i call you again okay very important uh, keeping that door open okay and particularly you know you may be interviewing people who are very busy who it's taken you sometimes 2 months to get that interview right so once you've established the rapport of course for uh, interviews like that even in general your prep must be excellent so you don't have these situations but just in case you do keep that door open okay right here is an interview guide that you could use that we will share with you um and it's a template that lets you helps you to plan your interview right so open or general questions what are some broad questions you, so you can ask to open the quest, uh, conversation and to warm people up so think about the questions you want to ask and write them down okay and then go deep what are some questions that can that can help you start to understand this person's hopes fears and ambitions hopes fears and ambitions you're going deeper now you're getting to understand the deeper emotional issues that you want to design for right uh, it in 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 uh the creation of an excellent design you invariably will have understood these deeper issues and therefore your design becomes excellent the deeper issues of you know uh why people like to manage their music the way they do that was understood and therefore the excellent product resulted why people are struggling and what are the deeper problems and issues and uh aspirations with getting good transportation service that they don't have to break their head over and uh, get into a real stressful situation trying to get somewhere therefore because those deeper issues were understood therefore it resulted in the excellent uh, product like 
you know, obviously the first one I was talking about the iPod, the second one I am talking about Uber, much quoted examples today with good reason. Okay? So, there you sit and write down all of these before you go to the person. Do not go blank and make sure do not write this as you are in the bus uh, about to reach their door. Do not do that. This is a very important and precious piece of information that you are going to get out of this person. Do not take it uh, uh, you know frivolously because then you might as well not do the interview. So, spend you do not need to spend a lot of time, but you do need to spend time calmly in one place before you get to the interview to sit and write these down. Okay? So, let us look at uh, an example in this. Um, in this example, this team was trying to uh, understand um, uh, saving behaviors among low income communities. How do they manage and save their money? So, let us look at some of the general open questions that they ask. What kind of job do you have? How are you paid? Right? How do you save for the future? These are open general questions. Then how do you allocate your money now? Asking some deeper questions. How do you allocate your money now? Where do you actually keep the money you want to put aside? When you want to put aside money, what do you actually do? What helps you save money? So, motivations, you are trying to understand the motivations. If you visited a bank, tell us about your experience. Okay? So, very interesting deep questions as you can see and these it is very unlikely that if you were writing this at the doorstep of the person you were going to visit, you would probably have come up with these questions alone. There is no way you would have been able to come up with these questions. Okay? So, therefore, I emphasize once again, please give a little thought to arriving at these questions. All right, mental models. The reason we are doing all this, the reason we are probing users, the reason we are trying to understand what is in their minds is because we want to define the mental model. We want to understand what is in their mind, so we can design to that we can design in line with what they are expecting. Right? Remember the question when we asked what were you expecting. Right? So, when doing user research, we try to uncover the mental models of the target audience. That is the whole purpose of research, to uncover the mental models and understand their language and values, their language, their terminology. Okay? So, here is an example. Um, what we imagine people are thinking that they are all smiles, they are confident, they are decisive, they are passionate and what are they saying? Oh my God, I love this software. This is exactly what I have been waiting for for my whole life. Quick, sign me up for the lifetime plan. I am going to invite every single person I know to sign up at, as well. My life is finally complete. This is what we think as designers. We think that our users, because we are in love with our products, we are in love with our designs, because we are spending so much time, energy and effort on them. So, we imagine that this is exactly how the user feels. Well, what is the reality? A more realistic scenario. What is their expression? Furrowed brow, unsure, indecisive, frustrated. And what are they saying? Huh? What is this? What does it do? Is it worth my time? Will it be a valuable piece of software worth switching to? Will I have to change what I currently do if I want to use it? Does anybody I know use it? Do they like it? This is the reality. Okay? So, be very aware that this is how a user potentially feels. And if we are able to understand this, then we can design better. Otherwise, we are going to create this and then it is going to bomb. Okay? Now, I would ask you, um, many of you, most of you probably have cell phones. So, on your mobile phone, think about how many contacts you have. Maybe 
500, 400, 1000, 600, you have all those contacts. So when I say contacts to you, your mental model is that, that lines and lines of names that uh, live in your phone, right? Now, what is the mental model of contacts of a person with low literacy? This is how she stores her numbers in little, 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 little chits of paper in her purse. Okay? And then when she needs to find a number, this is how she's rummaging through the whole thing. Now, if we, in designing for this kind of user, which people seldom do, if we were cognizant of this, then perhaps we would come up with a very different model than expecting them, expecting her to conform to the uh, contacts, the way it is designed in the cell phone, right? So this is her mental model of contacts, very, very different probably from your mental model of, contra uh, of uh, contacts, right? So what is a mental model? It's a person's thought process about how something works. A mental model, it's in the user's head. It is not the reality. It is what is in their head, what they expect, what they think it is. Okay? Um, remember in the first section, I showed you right in the beginning that person and the microwave. And it says one part of it is how it works, how the microwave works. And then the second part is how it works according to me, according to me, that is his mental model. So a person's thought process of how something works, how it works, that is in their head, not necessarily how it actually works. Okay? So we do research in order to derive mental models. Let us look at another example. Okay? This is a study that was done uh, of things that were on the front page of a university website. Okay? A university website had all of these, campus photo, slideshow, letter from the president, statement of the school philosophy, alumni in the news, virtual tour, press releases, promotions for campus events, etc. And what are the things people were looking for? They were looking for application forms, usable campus map, campus address, campus police, academic calendar, parking information, faculty, department list, etc. What was the common, the commonality between what people were looking for and people that, uh, and things that were on the site is the name of the school. Okay? So, it is very important that these two merge together and we have many more of these things within this. So, what is put on the product is what the user is expecting. So, we begin over here, we try and understand what the user is expecting and then we design the product accordingly. We design it to be this. Okay? That is the purpose of mental models, to close the gap, the big gap between what we think is what the design needs to be, we the designers, we the engineers, versus what the user thinks the design needs to be. Okay? That is the gap. 